Hi and welcome to my third video in a series of five about Oath, the new and already famous game of Cole Worley published by Leather Games. At this time, the days of fellowship and peaceful trade are over. Today, it's time to fight and kill each other. Here is the map board and blue player's mat. And as you see, there are warbands here and there. Warbands are troops that you, as an influential figure, muster and train as you travel through the empire. They were your colors, they are your personal army. Every player owns a reserve of 14 warbands, 24 for the purple color. At setup and after, some of these warbands will enter the game. A warband then can only be in two different places. First, it can be on a site, like here, blue warbands on the lush coast or on the steppe. Warbands on a site are controlling it by sheer strength. Your personal pawn doesn't have to be there. Warbands alone ensure blue control over land and population. When a player has a warband on a site, he rules that site. As you see on the lush coast, even if grey player's pawn is on the site, blue rules it because he has a warband there. A warband is a group of dozens of warriors, a pawn is a single man. Blue player doesn't rule the plains because he has no warband there, his pawn alone is not enough. Warbands can also be placed on the player's mat. Here there are four warbands on blue player's mat. And these are the player's own Praetorian Guard, a small army that follows its master wherever it goes. These soldiers don't spend their time ruling land and people, they just follow their master. So, on the plains, for example, one can say that even if not on the map, there are blue armies there because Blue Pound is here and his personal guard of four warbands is somewhat included inside his pawn. But no, Blue Player does not rule the plains. Ok, and where do the warbands come from? At the beginning of the game, each player starts with a personal guard of three warbands on his mat, plus some imperial warbands on the map, more on that later. But during the game, there's a special action to gather and hire troops, this is the muster action. First, if you want to recruit troops, there must be people on your site, there must be a denizen. Then, you pay one supply, you give one favor to the denizen and you get two new warbands that you take from your reserve and put on your personal mat. Note that these new mustered warbands don't give the control of the site to blue player. Blue player still doesn't root the planes. Mustered warbands always go to player's mat. And because there's now a favor on the taming charm denizen, blue player cannot deal with this denizen anymore. He cannot trade or he cannot pay to use his power. But there is another denizen and blue player decides to muster again. One supply, one favor, two warbands. At the end of his turn, as usual, every favor on a denizen goes to its matching bank, arcane and nomad suits in our example. Ok, we know how to muster and gather a large army. And, as we already saw, having a large army on your personal mat is not enough to claim the control of a site. Blue player does not rule the plains even if he brought and mustered there his army made of 8 warbands. If you look at the map now, 3 sites are unexplored, face down, 2 are neutral, no players rule them, Two are ruled by blue player and one is ruled by red player. A site is either ruled by one player or not ruled at all. It is impossible to see on the same site two warbands from different players. Ok, and why is it so important? Why bothering? Because as you know, ruling site is one of the four basic goals of the game, so if the current oath is the oath of supremacy, or if as an exile, you got the vision of conquest, you want to be the player who rules the most sites. Ok, but what else? There is another reason to rule sites. If your warbands rule a site, you can use the power of these sites denizen as if your pawn was here. 
Here, for example, blue player, of course, can use Taming Charm and Elder's powers because they share his spawn site. But blue player can also use the powers of the Storyteller or the Forest Path because these denizens dwell in sites that blue player rules with his warbands. For example, very soon, blue player will travel to the river to attack Red Army. Travel that far to the hinterland will cost 4 supplies. Luckily, blue player rules the steppe where the forester lives, so he can pay one favor and use his power as if he shared his sight. There are other actions where a player interacts with denizens. Player can trade or use denizens to muster, but for these actions, player must still share denizens' sight. He can use his warbands only to use denizens' power in the site he controls. But still, that's huge. A pawn on a side can use one, two, or at most three denizen powers. If you add all denizens on sites he can rule with his warbands, that can make a huge difference, being able to use the powers of far more denizens. Okay, so blue player understood all that and wants to travel to the river and fight there the Red Army to kick it out and take the control of this site and its denizen. So, just as we saw, he gives one favor to the forester on a blue controlled site to use his power and travel to the river for no supply at all. Okay, and still, there is no fight. Two players can coexist on the same site without fighting. The river is still ruled by red player. There is a fight only if one player triggers it with the campaign action. Let's do that here. Blue player spends the action cost on two supplies and a battle starts for the military control of the river. Let's resolve this battle. A player who starts a battle, the player who paid for the campaign action, must declare what player is the defender. There can be only one defender. You can never attack two players at once. Here, blue player declares that red player is the defender. Then he must declare his target, what exactly he is attacking. Here, blue player attacks the site, the river territory, because he wants to gain its control. We will see later that other targets are possible. A player can even attack more than one target at once. Both defender and target must be consistent. Targets must belong to the chosen defender. Here, for example, it's okay because red player is currently ruling the targeted site. So, blue player can declare his defender as red player and his target as the river site. And from then, it's very easy. First, we compute defender strength as a number of shields, starting with the targeted site. The site's defense strength is a number of dice. We can find it on the top right of its card. Here, it's one die. Defense dice are always blue dice. Defense strength is also linked to the number of defending warbands. This time, it's not a number of dice, it's the exact number of shields. We add up warbands that are on the site and warbands on the defender's player mat if the defender player spawn is here on the battle site. There's one red warband on the river side, so one shield, plus the three warbands, three shields, from red player's mat, because red player spawn is there on the river. Okay, that's for the defender. Now, let's compute the attacker strength as a number of swords. That's even simpler. The number of swords will be given by a number of attack dice equal to the number of attacking warbands. 8 warbands on blue player's mat, 8 attack dice. Attack dice are red dice. A defense die is a special die with these sides. The times 2 side doubles the result of the other thrown dice. It doesn't multiply the number of shields counted from warbands. An attack die looks like this. Hollow swords count as a half a sword. You need two hollow swords to make one full sword. Skull result counts as two swords but eliminates one warband from attacking army. In our example, that's unfortunate but 
blue player uses red dice and red player blue dice. But you should get used to it because attacker always use red dice and defender blue dice. So here we are, red player throws one defense die and blue players throw eight attack dice. Total defense is five shields. Total attack, five hollow swords give two swords for a total of six swords. If the attacker has more swords than the defender has shields, he wins. Six versus five. Here, blue player, the attacker, wins. If there is a tie, defender wins. Loser loses half his warbands. Here, red player loses two warbands out of four. They are eliminated and go back to his reserve. He'll be able to muster them later. Then, all surviving losers' warbands go to his mat. If the defender wins, nothing else happens, defender stands his grounds and doesn't move. But if the attacker wins, know that the site is empty, he can add as many warbands as he wants to the site itself. Here first, don't forget, blue player loses one warband because he rolled a skull. Then he decides to put, let's say, two warbands on the river. Note that red player spawn stays on the river side, but he doesn't rule it anymore. Blue player from now is ruling the river. Et voilà, this one was so easy. Let's look now at some more advanced examples. It's blue player's turn again, and this time he decides to attack gray player to take control of the lush coast. Red player spawn is here, but for control purposes, only warbands matter. On the lush coast, warband is grey, so grey player rules the lush coast. If blue wants to take control, he must attack grey player. In preparation for the assault, blue has gathered a strong personal army on his mat. Grey player also has some defenses. So let's fight. Blue player must first travel to the site he wants to attack, the lush coast. But beware, in this game, only player pounds can move. The four warbands that share Blue Pound's location cannot go with him. In fact, there is a solution. Remember the list of all possible actions. One free action can here be very convenient. Reorganizing warbands. It's free, it costs no supply, and it allows you to freely transfer warbands from your personal mat to the site you are in and vice versa. But only, of course, if you rule the site you are in. If you happen to be in an empty site, a site that no one rules, you cannot simply transfer warbands to it and take its control. You cannot rule a site without fighting through a campaign action. We will see later how to deal with empty sites. And for now, blue player can let on the planes just one warband to keep ruling it and take with him, on his mat, the other three to have the largest possible army. Note that blue player cannot take all his warbands from his site because if he does that, he won't rule the site anymore and players cannot on purpose give up control of a site. Ok, now blue player feels ready and now he can travel to the lush coast. Travel action inside the cradle region, it costs one supply. Then, campaign action, blue player pays two more supplies and attacks the lush coast. Ok, and now remember how every campaign starts by stating who is the defender and what are the targets. The defender here is not so obvious because two other players share the lush coast, grey player but also red player. Blue can choose one or the other as a defender, not both. One campaign action can only be aimed at one defender. Here, blue player wants to take control of the lush coast, so he must choose a grey player as defender, because with his warband, grey player is currently ruling the lush coast. Remember, ruling is a matter of warbands, not pounds. And now the target. Easy, he wants to rule the lush coast, his target is the lush coast. But then he can extend the campaign to other targets. In fact, he can extend the war to all sites where the defender has warbands. Here, 
he could also declare as his targets the river and the mountain. Whatever site Grey Prayer is ruling with his warbands, no matter distances, anywhere on the map. So now, Blue Player must set the scope of the war he's about to unleash. The problem is the mountain. If Blue Player declares the mountain as one of his targets, he adds three Grey Warbands, but also Grey's Pawn, that is, Grey's Personal Army on Grey's Player's Mat, that is, four more Warbands. A defender's pawn which is on a site declared as a target can always add his personal army to the war. So, blue player cautiously declines and attacks only two targets, the lush coast and the river. Now, let's do the math. The attacker came with an army of eight warbands, so he will throw eight attack dice, then the defender, Two sides are attacked, so we add defend dice for both sides, and one shield per warband, we add up all warbands from all targeted sides, that's two shields. Okay, and this time we will also use battle plans. Battle plans are special denizens that can help during a war. They are generals or skilled warriors or mercenaries. This icon indicates a battle plan. It shows that this capability gives bonuses or penalties to the campaign action. In order to use a denizen's capability in combat, you must have this denizen next to your mat as an advisor, or you must rule the site where he lives. Beware, unlike other denizen's power, it's not enough to have your pawn on his site. You must actually rule it. Here, for example, the rangers live on the lush coast, which is one of the campaign's targets. Usually, you can use a denizen's power when your pawn is on his site. But for battle plans, you must rule the site. So here, blue player cannot use the ranger's capability, and grey player can. Alas, this capability is printed on a red background, and that means it is an attack capability. Grey player doesn't need it and decides not to use it. At least, it will not benefit to blue player. On the other targeted site, there are two denizens with battle plans. Grey player is ruling the site, so only he can use these bonuses. The first battle plan, the fire tokers, can be used in attack or in defense. In attack, it adds three attack dice. In defense, it removes three attack dice. But there's a prerequisite. The player must own the banner of the darkest secret. Grey player doesn't own it, so it cannot use this battle plan. The second one, the wrestler, is simpler. Grey player can gain one blue die if he accepts to lose one warband. He decides not to use it because he has only one warband per targeted site, and losing one means losing control over one site, so no. But thanks to the wrestler, blue player can use his advisor's battle plan. Look, blue player gains 4 attack dice if, in a target site, there's a denizen from the order suit. The wrestler being from the order suit, blue player can use this power. He pays one favor and discards another one, and that's it, 4 bonus dice. Okay, and that's not over, because players can use battle plans from every site they rule, not only sites that are targeted by the campaign. Blue player rules the planes and the step. So, blue player can use battle plans from the mercenaries, but he thinks he has enough attack dice and doesn't want to discard this denizen. He uses the scout's capability and gains one supply immediately, Grey player rules the mountain side. He uses the mountain giant capability to remove a three attack dice from blue player. The mountain giant card will be discarded at the end of the battle. He also uses the extra provision capability and gains one bonus defense die. Both these cards have a cost the grey player must pay, but it's not his turn, it's currently blue player's turn, so grey player cannot put favors or secrets on cards. So, he pays his favors directly to the matching bank, and he keeps his secret on his own mat, but face down to show that he cannot use it elsewhere. At the end of next grey player's turn, he will flip it back face up. And that's it. 
players used all battle plans they wanted, and now they roll the dice. Final result is 5 swords for blue player versus 8 shields for grey player. It seems that blue player, the attacker, lost the battle. He should lose half his warbands and resign to defeat, but the attacker has always one more option. For every warband that he sacrifices, he gains one sword. So here it's a no-brainer, if he does nothing and accepts the result, he loses half his forces, that is, four warbands, and he doesn't get control of the sites. But if he sacrifices the same four warbands instead, he gains four swords and wins the battle. It's not always that obvious, but keep in mind that the outcome of the battle is always easier for the attacker who can sacrifice his warbands to mitigate bad dice rolls. Now the battle is over. Grey player loses half his warbands, that is one of the two warbands. The other goes back to his mat, even if the player spawn was not involved in the battle. Then, blue player can distribute his warbands between both conquered sites. And finally, paid favor go to their matching banks and note that grey player's secret stays face down and useless, it will be flipped face up at the end of his own turn. The mountain giant is discarded, remember, that was the price to pay for his power. One last thing about battle plan. Let's suppose I have this battle plan as an advisor beside my player mat. I do a campaign action so I can play a secret on this card to use its power. I gain 3 bonus red dice in my attack. Now my campaign is over and let's say that with the remaining supply points I do a second campaign during the same turn. Usually when there's a token on a card you cannot use this card's power anymore. But battle plans are an exception. So for my second campaign I can again play a secret on my advisor and again add 3 red dice to my attack. Battle plan can be used even with a token already on it. Still, you can use a battle plan only once for a given battle. Now you know how to lead a campaign against several sites at once and with battle plans using your advisor's and denizen's capabilities. And that's a lot, but sheer force can be even more useful than that. Now it's time to summarize and expand on what a campaign is and what it does. So first, in a campaign, there's an attacker. That's you, the one who paid two supplies to perform the campaign action. And you go to war with your pawn and your mat. That means that the only warbands you will fight with are the ones that are on your mat, your personal army. If you have any warbands elsewhere, ruling sites, they won't take part in the campaign in any way. Then, you declare who is the defender. In a campaign, there's only one defender and it's someone who, in one way or another, shares your site. His pawn is on your site or he is ruling your site with one of his warbands. So here you, as white player, could attack yellow player because his pawn is on the same site as yours. Or blue player because his warbands are ruling the site you are on. And for example, you couldn't attack red player even if you rule the site is in. The defender must share the site your pawn is in. Let's say in our example that you are white player and you declare yellow player as the defender. Blue player will not take part in this campaign. Then you must declare your targets. And first you must have a target on your site, the site where your pawn is. Let's call it your main target, the one you attack personally with your pawn. We saw previous examples where your main target was the site itself. Here it would be possible if yellow player ruled the site. If the defender rules the site you are on, you must attack the site itself. It's mandatory. You cannot ignore the warbands and just attack other players pawn. Here you could not attack yellow pawn without attacking the yellow ruled site, the planes. Ok, then you add other targets, other sites ruled by the defender. 
We already saw that in previous examples. But campaigning is not only about taking control of new territories. It can also be more personal. And you can choose as your targets the defender's own person or belongings. If, and only if, the defender's pawn is on your side, sharing it with your own pawn, you can target relics he owns, banners, and even himself in the aim of banishing him. Here, yellow player owns two relics and the banner of the darkest secret. So, as white player, you can target one or two relics or his banners in order to steal them, or you can target the player himself in order to banish him. Let's see how it changes the way the campaign is resolved. You remember how we did it in previous examples. For the attacker, it doesn't change anything. The attacker throws as many red dice as he has warbands on his personal mat. Plus, any bonuses given by battle plans, which can be advisors beside his mat or denizens on sites he rules. He throws red dice and counts the swords. For the defender, it's a little more complex. Defense dice are not only added for targeted sites, but for all targets. Defense dice are blue dice, and their amount is found on every possible target card. Relics, banners, and player's mat. So, as you see, if the attacker targets the brass horse relic, the defender gets an intrinsic defense of two blue dice, and he adds the same way the defense dice of all declared targets, relics, and banners. For the banner of the darkest secret, the number of protective blue dice is equal to the number of secrets currently on the banner. Here, four. And finally, if the yellow player himself is a target, he gets the intrinsic protection dice against personal banishment. And all these dice add up. In this example, that would be a very bad target choice for the attacker with a total defense of 10 blue dice. And then the defender also gains direct shields, not dice, from his warbands. Those on targeted sites and those on his personal mat. Defender's mat warbands are added as soon as his pawn is on a targeted site or, of course, if he is targeted himself. So here, on the planes, even if white players declares to target only the site and not yellow player's pawn, nor his relics or banner, yellow player gets the shields from his personal warbands. If you are there where armies are fighting, you can always add your own warbands in the fight. Then, like the attacker, the defender can use battle plans from his advisors or denizens on site he rules. And all that summed up after dice rolls gives a total number of shields. In the end, remember, if the attacker has more swords than the defender has shields, he wins. If not, the attacker has still the option to sacrifice warbands to get one sword per discarded warband. And after all that, if the defender still wins, the attacker loses half his warbands and nothing else changes. If the attacker wins, the defender loses half his warbands and put the rest on his mat, then attacker distributes his own warbands freely between his mat and all the newly conquered sites. If the attacker targeted some relics, he captured them and put them beside his mat. The same for banners. And finally, if he targeted the defender's pawn itself, he banishes it. That means he eliminates half his favors, round it down, then he moves the defender's pawn in whatever site he wishes, regardless of distance and control. In our example, white player had targeted two sites, two relics, one banner, and the yellow pawn itself. And let's suppose he won, that is very unlikely considering the odds, but it's for the example. So, white player wins this campaign, Yellow player takes back on his mat all his warbands that have fought and loses half of them. White player takes control of the defeated sites, distributing his warbands as he sees fit. Then he takes all targeted relics and also the banner, but all captured banners always loses two tokens, favors or secrets. 
Here, because it is the banner of the darkest secret, it loses two secrets. And finally, the banished yellow player loses half his favors, fraction down, so one favor, and white player chooses a site to send yellow player to immediately. And that's it. Now you know how a campaign is fought and why. You fight a campaign to take control of sites because it's a victory condition and it gives you control over denizens and their powers. But campaigning is also a way to steal relics from opponents. Relics are rather scarce in this game and once a player has found one and recovered it with the recover action, there is no other way to get it than to attack its owner. For banners, it's not exactly the same. If you remember, controlling banners is a matter of auctioning, bidding favors for the banner of the people, secrets for the banner of the darkest secret. Campaigning is a way to shortcut this process and take by force a banner you couldn't afford. That being said, the more favors or secrets there are on a banner, the more defense die it will get. And when finally you take the banner by force, you take it with two favors or two secrets less, and for the people banner, you take it on its mob site. So it works, but it gives you a somewhat crippled banner. And finally, you can take advantage of a campaign to get rid of an opponent's pawn and send him far away. A last word about defense blue dice. These dice represent target's intrinsic defense. You find them on sites, relics, banners, and also on player's mat when a player is directly targeted. If a campaign targets a relic owned by the player, relics blue dice are used but not player's blue dice. These are used only if the player himself is targeted to be banished. So, blue dice are always linked to a target, but there is one exception, the Oathkeeper. This style belongs to the player who currently keeps the Oath, and every time this player is the defender in a campaign, he gets one bonus defense blue die. He gets two dice if he is an usurper, that is, if he is an exile player taking the Oath. Ok, finally, as you see, campaigning is not so complex, but still, it's a little fiddly and we must now study some specific situations to be sure you got it. First, this one. White player can declare a campaign against yellow player as the defender. And then he can declare as his target a yellow warband on another site, whatever how far it is. But, he must still declare a target on his own side. So, if yellow player has no relics and no banner, white player has no choice but to declare yellow pawn himself as his target, and he will banish him if he wins the battle. Should a blue warband be on that same site, exactly that same campaign could have been possible. Another short example. Here, white player cannot declare a campaign against yellow player because white pawn is not here. Actions are always made by pawns, which represents the player himself. So, in order to launch a campaign against yellow player, there must be a site where white pawn can directly attack a yellow target. The words your site mean the site where your pawn is. And another one to be sure you understand all the intricacies of this system. Here, white player wants to steal yellow's relic, the brass horse. So, white's target is the relic itself. It doesn't attack yellow's pawn. But, nevertheless, yellow will count his own warbands when defending. A player can always count warbands on his personal mat if the opponent's target is one of his relics his banner, or of course, himself. And what if you want to take control of a site but no other player is currently ruling it? You cannot just transfer warbands from your personal map to the site. You can do that only if you already rule that site. That is, if you have already at least one warband on it. If not, you must do a campaign against that empty site. In fact, if no player rules a given site, it is ruled by the bandits. That is what this tiny symbol does mean. 
Just imagine the bandit as a neutral player controlling all neutral sites. So, white player declares a campaign action, he pays two supplies, the defender is the bandit. And the target is the site. White player could include in this campaign any other neutral sites, just as if it were a real player controlling all neutral sites, but he could not include any unrevealed sites, of course. Here, let's do it simply. The attacker with three warbands gets three attack dice. The defender gets one blue die for the site intrinsic defense and one shield for the bandit warband, the one that is shown by the tiny symbol. And if there are any denizens with battle plans attached to this site, it is assumed that it belongs to the bandits. The bandits are ruling the site. But bandits having no player mat nor any wealth, they use battle plans cards only if it is cost free. Here, the attacker loses one red die, dice are rolled, ok, three swords, three shields, the attacker loses one warband because of the skull, and he must again sacrifice one warband to get the sword he needs to win this battle. Now, white player wins, he puts his only warband on the site to gain its control, had he no more warband, he could not have taken control and would have to campaign again against the same bandits to take control later. In any case, white now rules the marshes and he can now use the battle plan of longbows in any future battle. And this is the end of this third video. In the next, we will talk about politics. We will talk about the Chancellor and his Grand Scepter, the citizens and the exiles. We will talk about the Empire.